This is Crime Stories. I'm Richard Belzer. Al Capone, public enemy number one, the most notorious of all gangsters. In the 1920s during Prohibition, Capone ruled the city of Chicago with his Thompson machine gun and an iron fist. He used brute force and murder to maintain control over a vast network of distilleries, breweries, and brothels. Nicknamed Scarface, Capone's brazen charm and cold-blooded tactics made him a legend. But the story of the son of an Italian immigrant who built an empire from gambling, prostitution, and murder is all true. The Roaring Twenties. Prohibition has been in effect since 1920. Instead of cutting back on crime, it creates opportunities for lawlessness. Organized hoodlums from New York to Los Angeles take advantage of supplying thirsty America with illegal Nowhere is bootlegging more prevalent than working-class Chicago. The city is divided into gangland territories, where crooked cops and politicians give gangsters free reign. The king of organized crime is the son of an Italian immigrant family, Alphonse Scarface Capone. Capone's South Side Empire grosses $10 million a year. Anyone that gets in his way finds a one-way ticket to the morgue. On the city's north side, the Irish gangs run the same illegal operation. In 1929, 36-year-old George Bugs Moran is the boss of Chicago's north side gang. Moran is both ruthless and ambitious. Too ambitious. He begins hijacking Capone's liquor shipments. Capone decides to do something about it. February 14th, 1929. A car filled with police pulls up to the SMC Cartage Company, located at 2122 North Clark Street. Moran uses the warehouse to store illegal booze. The Moran people that were in the warehouse, they assumed when these people came in, it was an ordinary police roust, that they had to go through the angle of putting their hands on the wall and so on and so forth. Pretty soon when they did that, some real gunmen were there and began blazing away with machine guns, killing seven people in there. The world reads about it the next day as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. At the same time that this vicious butchery and killing was going on, Capone, who had already been targeted by, for tax violations, he had arranged on Valentine's Day to the hour of the shooting to be in a prosecutor's office in Miami answering questions. And he was. And he thought that would have been an ingenious alibi. That while, I, while my gang is rubbing out Moran, I'm being interviewed by a prosecutor in Florida. Moran escapes with his life, but gets the message and leaves Chicago for good. Alphonse Scarface Capone is now the sole emperor of Chicago crime. Law enforcement appears helpless to gangland violence. In fact, Chicago is so corrupt, the U.S. Department of Justice Prohibition Department forms a special unit to fight crime. Numbering just 12, each member was known to be uncorrupted. They call themselves the Untouchables. In this mission that came out of Washington, came personally from the office of the President of the United States. The untouchables were the street tactical personnel that were out breaking down doors, that were destroying dist uh, distilleries, that were arresting uh, gangsters. The untouchables leader is a handsome 26-year-old prohibition agent who himself will become a legend. Elliot Ness was a young man, a young graduate of the University of Chicago. He was a sharp young man, an ambitious man. He formed an elite group because he was so stunned that the fight against Capone had been not very feasible in the past because there was so much, much corruption that the Capone and the police worked hand in hand. So he got a handful of people who he called the Untouchables. Although they were considered uncorruptible, the Untouchables' tactics going after Capone raised questions about their true effectiveness. The fact of the matter is, Elliot Nets and the Untouchables really didn't much at all. Every once in a while, they, they were like Capone. They'd have a, a big event where they'd break into some kegs and they'd make sure all of the press
press was there to take pictures of them and doing what they were doing. And the fact of the matter is Capone would sometimes give them one of those just to appease them. Elliot Ness remains relentless in his personal quest to bring Capone to justice. Though Ness and Capone were driven men who basked in their own publicity, they could not be farther apart in appearance, morals, and background. The complex strongman Capone, feared by even the toughest gangsters, started life 30 years earlier as the fourth son of Italian immigrants Gabriel and Teresina Capone. His parents were born in Naples, immigrated to the uh, United States. Al himself was born in Brooklyn, as were some of his younger siblings. There was uh, absolutely no criminal background in his, fa in his father or his mother. His father, in fact, was a, uh, a barber, which was uh, a somewhat more respectable profession in the Italian community. Barbers being, in many cases, well-educated, being able to read and write. At the age of 10, young Al runs a shoeshine stand near Wall Street until he is brutally beaten at the hands of a gang of street toughs. So Al, from that moment on, knew that he had to beat his way, muscle his way into what he wanted. And I think, again, that was a, a lesson that he chose to hold on to for, the, for, for most of his life. Al attends Brooklyn's public school number seven, he is a large kid with a violent temper who hits a teacher that makes fun of him. Young Al Capone quits school after the sixth grade and becomes a member of a local kid gang. You could easily, if you chose, graduate to a real gang, and that was a career choice, and it was a career choice that Al Capone, unlike most of the kids in kid gangs, made. When he got to be a, an older young man, about 15, 16, perhaps 17, it's not clear just when, he entered the Five Points Gang. At the same time, he entered the employment of Frankie Yale, a real gangster. And from then on, his career was set. It was a career that had lots of risks, but also many potential benefits. So you either are going to be poor and be subservient to the powers to be, or you join the power. And that's what gave that underworld such a prominent spot in history, because they could get things done. They had people in politics in the police department in their pockets. Italian gangster Frankie Yale owns a beer joint on Coney Island called the Harvard Inn. In 1917, he hires the powerful, nearly six foot, 180 pound, 18 year old Al Capone to work as a bouncer and barman. Al Capone was very big, very tough, very hard, but he was also very smart. And that was an absolutely irresistible combination for someone like Frankie Yale, who needed people who were big and who had the beef to be authoritative and yet had the finesse and the intelligence to do it with grace, charm even. Al Capone could intimidate you while he was smiling and saying, please. How young Al Capone received the facial scars that he tried to hide the rest of his life when Crime Stories returns on Court TV. Crime Stories returns on Court TV. It's 1917. 18-year-old Al Capone works for gangster Frankie Yale as a bouncer and barman at Yale's Coney Island Club. He uses his strength and size to enforce the rules of the house. One night when a uh, young Sicilian hoodlum named Frank Galuccio came in with his... Uh, girlfriends and his younger sister Lena. Well, Al Capone, while serving the table, made some very fresh remarks to Lena, specifically, honey, you got a nice ass, and I mean that as a compliment. Frank Galluccio didn't take it as a compliment. Frank Galluccio, probably giving up uh, 40, 50 pounds to Al Capone and several inches, went for the razor he was carrying and went after Al Capone. Two swipes with the razor and Capone got a scar. And then he got the big scar on his left cheek that he's famous for. Galluccio grabbed.
stabs his sister and his date, then runs out. Capone is taken to a nearby hospital where three facial wounds require 30 stitches. There was a sit-down run by Joe Mazzaria, Joe the boss, and he decreed that on one hand, Al Capone was wrong and he may not get any kind of revenge for the cutting. On the other hand, Gugio overreacted and should not have cut him. Ever after that, Al Capone hated the fact that he had the scar and considered it a matter of shame. And he learns, I think, that if you settle things peacefully, you're going to always have to carry a scar. And I think that's a very important message that carries on throughout Capone's life. In 1919, Al Capone is 20. Frankie Yale sends Capone to collect money from a gambler that owes him. Capone finds some guy who is just going to call his bluff and say, you're going to have to blow me away to get the money. And Capone does it. Picks up his wallet leaves the body, delivers the money to Frankie Yale. Just at the point that Capone graduates to his first killing, he's also involved seriously with a woman, a good woman, a woman that can actually bring honor to his family. May Coughlin is a tall, pretty Irish blonde, nearly two years older than Al. Their courtship leads to an out-of-wedlock child, Albert Francis Capone. The two marry nearly three weeks after their son's birth. Al Capone is now a husband, a father, and at a crossroads. This is the only time when he clearly shows the ability to choose brain power over fists. And that is he decides to get out of town and take a legitimate job in Baltimore, where he works for the Aiello Construction Company. And it's this choice that this really is Capone's last chance to make a legitimate life. He goes to Baltimore, and he actually punches the clock. He has an office job. He gets taught how mortgages get amortized. He is learning, in fact, the fundamental basic rules of capitalism, how more money when invested properly, begets more money. But on November 14th, 1920, Al Capone's father dies. Al, his brothers Ralph and Frank, gather in Brooklyn to decide how to support their sisters and mother. An old family friend, Italian Johnny Torrio, attends the funeral. Torrio is now running gambling and vice rackets in Chicago for his uncle Big Jim Calissimo. Frankie Yale recommends Al Capone to Torrio. The two hit it off immediately. Johnny Torrio became Al Capone's mentor in the way Frankie Yale had, but much better because Torrio was a good deal brighter than, than Yale had been, knew a lot more, and had much more to teach Capone. On January 1st, 1920, Congress passes the Volstead Act, prohibiting the sale of alcohol. But ironically, prohibition creates a great opportunity for gangsters. John Torrio needs help in his expanding empire, so he invites Capone to Chicago. Chicago is the perfect place for an enterprising young Al Capone, because it's not just the gangsters who are crooked. Police chief in Chicago indicated in the 30 days of prohibition that 60% of the Chicago police force was involved in bootleg operations. So he had corruption from the very beginning, festering at all levels with the police department, all to the top where Bill Thompson was the mayor, who believed in a wide open town. February 1921, Capone boards a train, leaving his wife and son behind in Brooklyn. Arriving at Chicago's Union Station, the 22-year-old Capone believes he is taking a job to help support his recently widowed mother. But instead, steps into a city that he will change forever. Capone reports to Johnny Torrio, who begins training his protege. He insisted that Capone go to school and lose his accent. And 
start studying. He trained his mind and he trained him in the ways of the kind of crime that Johnny Torrio wanted to pursue, which was the crime of business, the business of crime, not being a hoodlum, running things the right way. Al Capone is tutored in the ways of sin, money, and Chicago gang wars as he climbs his way to the top. Next, when Crime Stories returns. Scarface Al Capone continues on Court TV. During the 1920s, organized crime is off to a great start. At its center is 24-year-old Al Capone. Al Capone probably is a person that's kind of a powerful gangster. They had uh, groups in New York who were vying for power, but that was a bunch of mustache peats shooting each other up in the 20s. They had no one dominant figure. Chicago was ruled by Al Capone, and because he became synonymous with organized crime, the syndicate, the mafia, call it what you will, he became a legend. He was the first real big gangster that the United States ever had. Al Capone begins his climb to the top by starting at the bottom. John Torrio's Chicago operation is grossing $4 million a year from beer and $2 million from prostitution. Capone works for Torrio's Chicago operation as a soldier, a young thug who has to do whatever he is told to earn his stripes. Soldiers are important assets to the various mob interests who have carved Chicago up into gang territories. It doesn't take long for tempers to get aggravated, for people to start fighting over these sums of money. And that's when Torrio needs somebody to kick some ass, or somebody who's not afraid of force. And that's Al Capone. He knows how to beat people's heads in. And so by 1922, Al Capone goes from the outposts of the racket up closer and closer to Torrio because Torrio knows that Capone can be personally trusted. Because of political pressure from Chicago's City Hall, Torrio moves his operation to Cicero, Illinois. Cicero, which is a West Suburban community in Chicago, has a background tradition of being a very corrupt organization there for years. That is corrupt in the sense that the mayor or the village president president of the village, whoever it was, he was in arm and arm with, with the mob. Still part of Cook County, it has a separate government and police force from Chicago. Cicero is politically controllable and becomes the perfect place to run vice, gambling, and beer. Torrio trusts Capone so completely, he puts him in charge of his organization when he moves his mother back to Italy. Rather than negotiate like Torrio, Al Capone and his older brothers Ralph and Frank rely on brute force to gain control. The young editor of a local newspaper, the Cicero Tribune, decides to write about the Capone's corrupt hold on Cicero. Uh, one day, I heard that uh, the Capones had opened a, a new brothel, a new whorehouse uh, on the edge of town. Uh, the, uh, I heard the fee was $5 which was a lot of money in those days. Robert St. John goes undercover as a customer. He feels if he can get to the right girl, he can find a story that will outrage the public enough to close down the brothel. If he is caught, the Capones will kill him. I picked out a girl that I thought would be uh, communicative, uh, look a little more innocent, less hard-boiled than the rest of them. And uh, I was right. She was very cooperative. She uh, spent the allotted time telling me her story of how she got into the business. Well, that's the way I filled a notebook full of amazing stories. The editorial appears the next day. St. John's story hits home. Within a week, a mysterious fire burns the brothel to the ground. Some days later, uh, as I was going to my office in Cicero uh, early, early one morning, I noticed that on two of the four corners of this intersection, there were a policeman standing, leaning against a post. I heard the screech of brakes, and I looked up, and there was a big black touring car. 
As I looked up, four men piled out of the car. I recognized immediately one of them as Ralph Capone. As they headed toward me, I dropped to the pavement and curled up because I tried to protect my head. They worked over me with blackjacks and, and billies and uh, a weapon I think the Capone gang invented, uh, a bar of some inside a heavy woolen sock uh, with which they would slap the victim at the base of the, uh, the brain, uh, the, on the back of the neck. St. John, beaten unconscious, is taken to a nearby hospital. He spends a week there. While checking out of the hospital, the young editor makes an alarming discovery. I went to the cashier's office to pay my hospital bill. And the girl said, oh, your bill was paid this morning. And I said, by whom? She said, well, there was a Italian-looking man. He had a scar on, uh, across his left cheek. Uh, otherwise, I don't know who he was. When St. John got out, he wanted to swear out a complaint. He went to the police chief of Cicero, Ted Svoboda, and said, I want to swear out a complaint against Ralph, one other I recognized, and a John Doe. I knew I could pick him out, though. The police chief said, St. John, you know Al's never going to stand for this. Finally, he said, well, all right, come back at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So at 9 o'clock the next morning, I uh, appeared in the squad room. He said, go up to my office on the second floor. I went up to the office on the second floor. I was looking out the window, and I heard the door close. And I turned around and from the window, and there stood the famous Scarface Al Capone. I had seen him before in the street. I'd never seen him up close like this before. Put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a roll of what looked like $100 bills. He said, uh, you lost your hand. I've taken care of the hospital bill. And he started peeling off these bills. I turned my back on him and I went straight out the door. St. John wrote in his book, <clears throat> that his only regret was he couldn't see Al Capone's face when he, St. John, turned on his heel without touching the money and stalked out. If he had seen the face, it probably would have registered nothing but just resigned disgust because Al Capone didn't have to do this. He had already bought control of St. John's paper, which changed its editorial policy radically. Indignant at the new ownership, Robert St. John packs his typewriter and leaves town for good. In 1924, Al Capone's boss, John Torrio, retires. He picks 25-year-old Capone as his successor. Capone ascends the throne, developing a reputation for cool business decisions. But just underneath the surface was a brutality that even gangsters feared. Al Capone rules Chicago when Crime Stories returns. Crime Stories returns on Court TV. In 1924, 25-year-old Al Capone has moved his wife, son, and mother to a suburb of Chicago. He rises to the top of the mob after he takes over John Torrio's Southside Chicago gang. Within the structure of the gang, loyalty means everything. Rival gangs put a price on Capone's head. Capone finds out that three of his own men are planning his assassination. He needs to set an example. Capone set him up in the classic gangster style. He planned an elaborate banquet in honor of his three best men, Scalise, Anselmi, and Ginta. All the guys got together apparently in Hammond, Indiana, across the uh, border from Chicago in a nightclub fraternal setting. Everybody left their revolvers at the door. Nobody would carry a gun. They dined. They drank well into the night, you know, feeding and toasting Scalise, Anselmi, and Ginta. And then, once these guys were thoroughly drunk, 
the mood changed, and Al Capone lost his smile and turned on him, accused him of their treachery. The bodyguards grabbed these guys, apparently tied them up, and then Al went after them with a baseball bat, and then they played a double header with Scalise, Anselmi, and Ginta. Everybody taking their turn, hitting these guys with baseball bats. When they found the bodies dumped on a uh, lonely uh, country road the next day, according to the coroner, I think in uh, John Scalise's case, there was not an unbroken bone in his body. The crime goes unpunished. The unstoppable Capone turns his attention to politics. During the mayoral elections of 1927, Capone reportedly gives over a quarter of a million dollars to former mayor Big Bill Thompson. Thompson wins the election and hangs a picture of Al Capone in his office. Capone can now move his headquarters back to Chicago and settles into the posh Lexington Hotel. He ran that place like it was his own castle. He just didn't wander up to see Al. Couldn't do that. He was riddled with Capone people, bodyguards, henchmen, flunkies, the entire Capone entourage, and the barbershop in the basement, and so on and so forth. He really ran things from that hotel suite. That was really his fortress. Inside the inner sanctum of Capone's castle was a complex king. He was not afraid of killing people to get what he wanted or what his bosses wanted. On the other side, though, a more complicated personality, he was quite nice to the people that he liked. He was very good to his extended family, very generous with them, as well as just with um, strangers that he met. Capone considers himself a businessman who, like any citizen of Chicago, wants to take care of his mother and family. He takes the advice of his mentor, Johnny Torrio, and buys a house out in the suburbs, far from the action of his empire. And so Capone buys the house at 7244 Prairie End, and that's what puts Al in this very strange position. He is the muscle man with a family. That's all he's ever wanted to be. That's all he was raised to be, is this guy who works hard, provides for his family. He's behaved that way. He's moved his family from Baltimore to Chicago, bought them a nice, quiet, modest house. But now he's also got to be king of the rackets. And he doesn't know how the king of the rackets should behave. He's got to invent this public persona to even create himself larger than life. He was Al Capone, and he certainly acted the part. Uh, now, obviously, in the courtroom, and he wore a proper business clothes. Always the hat, but the hat was not a the hat was, was usual in those days. But he was also infamous, if you will, for wearing these uh, outlandish colored suits. Lime green was one of his favorites. And you can imagine this, this 250 pound, five foot 11 fellow walking down the street in this tailor made lime green suit. I mean, you know, he, he had to look like a parrot or something. But I got to tell you, I bet there weren't too many people that laughed at him when he walked down in that suit. Capone creates a double life for himself. He sees an opportunity to shift the press's sentiment from gangland boss to charitable patron. When the Depression came along, Al Capone opened soup kitchens. He was a softly sentimental man who had enough money and enough smarts to realize that this was a very, very good move. When people really needed something and they applied to him, he answered their pleas. He became, in the popular mind of Chicago and later the nation, a sort of Robin Hood. Al Capone is what Al Capone is today in the American psyche because he, unlike any of the other gangsters, courted the press. The press reports that Capone serves as many as 10,000 meals a day. Capone states, if I've given a cent to the poor in this man's town, I'll bet I've given a million dollars. Yes, a million. But the press also records an alarming increase in gangland violence. Since Prohibition began a decade earlier, over 500 gangland murders are recorded. To combat this lawlessness, the Chicago Crime Commission creates a publicity campaign that remains today. They choose public enemy number one, next on Crime Stories. 
Scarface Al Capone continues on Court TV. February 1929. Al Capone's use of violence to gain territorial control of an empire that grosses him $10 million a year catches the attention of the public. Between the start of Prohibition in 1920 and 1930, the Chicago Crime Commission records more than 500 gangland murders, including the famous St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Many feel that Al Capone engineered the murders of seven men on February 14, 1929, to get rid of his rival, Bugs Moran. Although it was gangsters killing gangsters, the cold-blooded nature of standing seven unarmed men against a wall and machine-gunning them in the back has a chilling effect on America. The Chicago Crime Commission, a group formed a decade earlier to monitor city corruption, decides to take matters into its own hands. At the helm of the commission is a former prosecutor, 78-year-old Frank J. Loesch. So the Crime Commission, the straight authorities of Illinois, of which there weren't too many, but the straight authorities understood that the first problem was to dent Capone's popularity. And that's how the Crime Commission came to create this thing called public enemy number one. They had to create their own set of hype and glitz to demonize Capone. And that's what public enemy number one was. It was a marketing tool. It was spin doctoring. Loesch creates a list of the top 100 criminals and places 28 in order, starting with public enemy number one. Al Capone heads the list. Three days before the list is published, Capone heads for his Florida mansion, located near Miami. There he encounters a neighbor who doesn't like Capone's presence. Tragically for Capone, the neighbor was a very good friend of a fellow by the name of Hoover, who happened to be the president of the United States. So the neighbor talked to Hoover and said, I've got this balloon head from Chicago down here making all kinds of noise. I hear he's a big gangster. Why can't you people do something about it? And Hoover said, well, we will. And believe it or not, that was why they started going after Capone. Al Capone was probably, maybe with the exception of Lindbergh, the most famous American around the world, and Hoover hated it, that here was a gangster better known than, for instance, the President of the United States. At the direction of the U.S. District Attorney's Office, a special team of agents are created to investigate Al Capone. Their leader is Elliot Ness. Ness strategizes with his untouchables. They believe the best way to go after Capone is to hurt him where his profits are, destroy his breweries, and that's what they do. But behind the scenes, there was another end to this whole effort, and that was the uh, analytical part of this. Uh, that was the part that really produced the specific charges that were listed later on Al Capone's indictment. The Internal Revenue Service develops an angle based on a Supreme Court opinion that illegal income must be reported to the IRS, therefore becoming taxable. Failing to file income taxes becomes a felony. Capone has cleverly put everything he owns in someone else's name. After years of frustrating dead ends, Task Force Commander Frank Wilson nails a break. He finds a tough Capone bookkeeper from one of the Cicero gambling joints named Fred Reese. It was Reese's job to take the money at the end of the day, the profits from this business, substantial profits I might add, and he would then walk a couple of blocks down the street to the bank in Cicero. The bank teller told Wilson that one time Reese came in and dumped the money on the counter, and lo and behold, there was a cockroach in the bag where the money was. And the teller said, my God, when, it, when and this cockroach appeared, Reese jumped back, he turned to ash, and, and he just got sick, and he said he couldn't go near that money, near the bag, and she, she said, well, What's the problem, Mr. Minister? Well, she called him Mr. Dunbar, and he said, I just have this, this tremendous phobia. I can't stand bugs, and particularly cockroaches. Reese is arrested in St. Louis, but says he won't talk. Authorities move Reese to Chicago, but make an unscheduled stop at a Danville, Illinois jail. 
Why the Danville jail? And then they had the judge hide the commitment papers. Why? They didn't want Capone to know or Capone's people to know that he was in jail or because they had no reason to hold him, of course. On the third floor of the jail is a single old cell. When they put him in a cell, they made sure there were cockroaches and bugs there. As I say, they played hardball. This guy was a tough guy, maybe, but he couldn't take that. And pretty soon he would say, Uncle, Uncle, I'll do anything. Fred Reese turns state's evidence and becomes the witness the prosecution needs to take Al Capone to trial. In 1931, uh, plans were made. Uh, the indictment was passed and plans were made to put Al Capone on trial. Uh, the newspapers had a field day writing about this, that they're never going to put him in prison for tax law. Nobody goes to jail for tax law. While the IRS agents are lining up their case against Capone, Elliot Ness and his untouchables close in. Somebody has stolen uh, their publicity. The IRS people, these people who walk around with the pencils in their pockets, are suddenly go go going in in front of Elliot Ness. My God, this can't happen. This shouldn't happen. So Elliot Ness and his people rush in now, and they decide to indict Capone also. The Untouchables actually made a 5,000 count case against Al Capone for violating the prohibition law. Well, the prohibition violation case was never brought to court. They never tried that case. They tried the income tax evasion case. So it was really the IRS, through accounting and detective work, that got Al Capone. It wasn't Elliot Ness and the Untouchables. Al Capone, who once listed his profession as secondhand furniture dealer, is charged with income tax evasion for the years from 1924 through 1929 and two counts of failure to file in 28 and 29. George E.Q. Johnson leads the prosecution. Capone is represented by the premier criminal defense firm of Nash and Ahern in the court of Judge James H. Wilkerson. The government had a very simple case. This man is lying on his taxes. And the jury had to believe it because look at all the way he was living and look at the income he was claiming. Capone was very careful. He did not, he himself never kept any kind of records to speak of. He had an accountant handle it for him. But in those days, they could figure, the government argued, that if a man had a certain lifestyle and lived high up the hog, as we called it then, yet his income was, he couldn't account for much of his income. He was probably cheating Uncle Sam. The government's theory in place, jury selection begins. In October of uh, 1931, when the trial was nearing its start, uh, juror pools were amassed. And uh, through connections and through bribery, they found out which jury uh, pool was going to serve in Judge Wilkerson's room. <laughs> At least 10 people were approached with bribes of cash and other things of value uh, for a favorable finding if they were on the Al Capone jury. Well, Judge Wilkerson was made aware of this through his uh, vigilance, and he switched at the last minute to jury pools with another judge. Will 12 ordinary citizens bring down the most notorious and influential gangster in America? The jury's verdict when Crime Stories returns. Crime Stories returns on Court TV. October 7th, 1931. The prosecution opens its case against Al Capone. During the course of six days of testimony, the jury hears how Capone bought silk underwear and diamond belts how he contributed $15,600 to his church. And ironically, in 1925, how he donated to the Police Widows and Orphans Fund, a colossal $58,000. The prosecution closes in less than a week. October 17th, the jury begins deliberation. All of America waits to find out if Al Capone, public enemy number one, will be convicted, not for murder, or racketeering, but for failure to file his income tax. Al Capone expected to get a very lenient sentence, even after the uh, jury tampering didn't work. So I think Al Capone's expectation was, well, even if they do convict me, I'll either get a slap on the wrists, or you know, I might walk away almost completely free with 
to find if I can fix this thing uh, up at the higher levels. After only eight hours of deliberation, the jury finds Al Capone guilty of three felonies for tax evasion and two misdemeanors for failing to file an income tax return. Although Capone spent millions of dollars in bribes over the years he reigned as crime czar of Chicago, he is sentenced to 11 years in jail. He wasn't being sentenced for tax evasion. He was being sentenced for being the public enemy number one. He was being sentenced for being the head of the mob in Chicago. The reason Capone got 11 years for tax evasion was because he was Al Capone. The empire Al Capone built that netted him $10 million a year crumbles. Capone is sent to the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Then in 1934, after numerous investigations regarding Capone's alleged special treatment, he is transferred to one of America's most notorious prisons, Alcatraz. The toughest part of prison for Capone wasn't maybe the hardship of staying in Alcatraz, which is no country club by any means, but the fact he was being treated, number one, is just another guy. But the parade had passed Al Capone by. He was treated just like anybody else by the guards. They didn't show him any respect. They didn't pay him any homage. The warden didn't care much about him. He was just another prisoner. And worse than that, the other prisoners began to treat him with contempt. Eventually, he was even assaulted. Al Capone, for his ego, had been shattered. Deteriorating health, threats, and a stabbing take their toll on Al Capone. By 1939, after serving eight of his 11-year sentence, public enemy number one is released from prison. He chooses not to return to Chicago, but instead moves to Florida with his wife and son. There, he lives a reclusive life. In 1947, at the age of 48, America's most notorious criminal, Al Scarface Capone, dies of syphilis. He claimed people misunderstood him, that he really had a heart. Others believe he was the most vile criminal who walked the face of the earth. The Al Capone was a murderer. He was a murderer in the fact that he not only took part in murders that couldn't be prosecuted for fear of retribution, but that he had uh, ordered the murders of approximately 300 of his rivals and his enemies. His legend only gets bigger with time. Chicago was ruled by Al Capone he became synonymous with organized crime, the syndicate, the mafia, call it what you will. He became a legend. He was the first real big gangster that the United States ever had. Capone symbolized a rise from a kid who lived in the slums to a man who owned all kinds of property and practically ran the the gangster element in the United States. That's an awful lot of power for somebody to have. Millions and millions of dollars went through his hands. Al Capone exemplified the criminal as a businessman, the son of a poor immigrant who rose to the top, creating organized crime and strong-arm extortion for generations of gangsters to come. Al Capone's life was an astonishing mix of contrasts. On the one hand, a brutal killer, and on the other, a family man loyal to his friends and generous to the city's poor. He became a multi-millionaire by catering to the public's appetite for prostitution, liquor, and gambling. But it was his unflinching commitment to brutal violence that earned him the reputation as America's most famous godfather. For Crime Stories, I'm Richard Belzer.